thank you so much for this day, and we thank you for your love for us that truly is forever. Um, thank you that we're able to gather together to worship you, and we pray today, Lord, that they open our hearts and open our minds so that we focus on you and see your message. My name is Joe Cade. I'm a pastor here. We're so grateful that you joined us in worship today. I want to say something just briefly about last week and what we did in response to the storm. I think we found a template of what we're going to do when we have that kind of threatening weather, weather or whatever reason. Um, you can go to our website, memorialgreer.com, and it will have the exact thing on the front page of what we're doing. Um, but I think if we have a service, it will be at 10 o'clock because we can have a 10 o'clock sign on the road. 
that service will be in the sanctuary because we don't have to set everything up. We uh, had staff and uh, volunteers. They were off, no nursery. The children were just in there crawling around a little bit, which was fine, and it was just low-key. You know, all the stuff we do, all the stuff we plan, all the stuff we build, the ultimate core of a gathering of people is to worship. And so we have one worship service that's as simple as possible, and we had a great crowd. Uh, that Sunday morning, uh, you can see it on the website. Um, that is what we will do. Uh, so just pay attention to that. If that should uh, pop up again. We have a spiritual life council. That's a uh, fairly new name to you. It's been around for about 18 months. Um, Bobby McQuay is the chair of that committee. It's been called this uh, entity that's like this. It's been called the Council on Ministries before. It's been called the Program Council before. It's the Spiritual Life Council, and it considers these five practices. Radical hospitality, passion worship, intentional faith development, risk-taking mission and service, and extravagant generosity. That group has um, been meeting all year long to say, what in the world are we? And now they're starting to say, okay, what in the world are we going to do about it? Um, so we have uh, two announcements this morning. We won't normally give you two, um, but given last week, um, we wanted to hold one back. Um, so I'm going to ask John Tomanko to come up. He's part of a group uh, that considers uh, building the depth of your worship building, the depth of your um, faith development, and he's going to tell us about prayer and partners. Good morning, everyone. Have you ever had a time when uh, you've been out uh, going shopping or going to, going to work and meeting, meeting some individuals as you're coming into work, or maybe even on Sunday morning meeting people, and they'll ask you how you're doing, and you usually will say, oh, I'm doing okay, I'm doing fine, or I'm hanging in there, just hanging in there. All the time you're thinking to yourself, well, I've got this going on, I've got that going on, things that you're struggling with. I think we've all probably done that at times in our lives. Well, Spiritual Life Council would like to invite you to be, be a prayer partner with someone else. Huh? Being someone who could uh, talk with you as an individual each week, share what you're going through, uh, develop a deeper relationship with you and with each other as you pray for each other and care about each other. John Wesley, uh, when he was uh, founder of the United Methodist Movement, or the Methodist Movement here in the United States, uh, he had class sessions, and in his class sessions he usually asked individuals how it was with their soul. And that goes deeper than just how are you, are you doing okay, and all that sort of thing. It goes to the heart of, heart of yourself and your, your relationship with God. How is your relationship with God? How is it with the church and with other individuals? And Wesley would also continue on with that same thought, asking you whether or not you're going on to perfection. What are you doing to improve your relationship with God? And so as prayer partners, we would, I envision that uh, you would meet, meet together each week or talk with each other, ask how you're doing, go through that sort of thing, and then also talk about what uh, you're trying to do to improve your relationship with God this week and in the future. So if you're interested in that, we have a meeting here next Sunday, right after worship service here in this room. We'll be talking a little bit about prayer partners and how you might go about establishing a prayer partner and, and getting involved with that program. So please join us with that. Steve Barbary is going to come up and tell us about men's night. This um, first announcement is for anyone, prayer partners. We're trying to emphasize gathering men on a periodic basis. This is a, t this is a thing that you've done in the past. Uh, that we've let go a little bit. Steve's going to talk to us about bringing that back. Good morning. Hopefully you've noticed over the past few weeks uh, in the bulletin and newsletter about a men's night that we have scheduled for Tuesday night, October the 2nd at 6.30. You know, I've been a member here at Memorial for over 38 years, and I'm seeing a lot of good things going on in Memorial right now. And we should all feel blessed to be part of that growth of this time. Uh, we're seeing families joining our church, uh, a children's program that is filling our rooms with the future of our church, and we also have music programs in both services that are second to none. But with growth, many times comes growing pains, and as we're scattered throughout two services each week, we become maybe like two churches of strangers with a lot of faces that we really don't know. We just see in passing on Sunday morning. Our women have an active United Methodist women's program, but the men, we've tried to get some programs started in the past, and Brett started the Honey Dudes, and, but we've had a little bit of trouble getting started as a group of men here. 
and thus the idea for a men's night, where we invite all the men of the church to come together that night for a fellowship, food, and music that will be led by Charlie Mellon. Uh, I firmly believe that God is going to lead us as men of this church to where he wants to carry us. Uh, men, I'm asking that you consider taking an hour and a half out of your busy schedules that night and come together for a night of fellowship. Our program will be led by Ben Dismukes, who uh, runs the Evans Training Center, and it houses recovering men with addiction issues. He himself is a recovering addict of 15 years. It'll be informative, uh, and you may think that your family will never be hit with an addiction crisis. Uh, I once thought that, but my family uh, did not uh, make that. Uh, we did not escape and fell victim to the heroin and meth crisis read about every day in this, uh, in this world. Uh, ben uh, has given his life to witnessing and caring for men who would otherwise not have a chance at recovery. And it's all faith-based through how God moves him and through those men. So come give us a try that night. See what we have to offer. We plan to be out by 8.15 so you'll be home early. Uh, you can sign up online by September 27th, uh, and if you plan to attend. And we also have sign-up sheets in the back here this morning where you can register as you leave. We need to know how many we're going to have for food and everything. There is no cost but your time. Uh, congregation, I ask for your prayers for the men of memorial that we may renew old relationships, grow new ones, uh, and come together in spiritual growth be the hands and feet of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, let's show up and show Pastor Joe that we as men can come together in this church and be a Bible group and carry the message to the community. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. There's going to be great food, great music, and 30 people. I know for a fact. Because we're going to get 30 people to sign up and come to it because it's going to mean something. We're not going to ask you to be uh, some type of volunteer for the next six years if you come to the night. You'll instead just be coming, hearing an inspirational word, and meeting men that you may not otherwise typically meet. We won't have uh, uh, three-leg races. We won't do uh, whatever, sack races. We won't. It's just getting together and hanging around with each other, and I hope that um, you're willing to do that. So that's the Spiritual Life Council. We're going to hear from them more and more as we consider ways that we can develop our faith. Let's pray together. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for drawing us together today in your house for a time of reflection, time of prayer, time of singing, and time of proclamation. As we read an incredibly difficult text that's charged with emotion, help us, Lord, to hear the message rather than make assumptions. Help us to understand what you would have us to do and how you would have us to live going forward from this place. It's in your son's holy name that we pray. Amen. Yeah. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. That's our sophisticated signal if I've missed something. Hey, buddy. Still doing something. All right, let's look at our first um, phrase. The Lord's blessing. When you hope for the Lord's blessing, when you offer the Lord's blessing, when you pray for the Lord's blessing, <clears throat> I hope that you will be impacted by what we read today. The things that the Lord blessed, the path that was taken by a blessed person, and the uh, obstacles in that blessed person's way have a lot to do with your ability 
keep moving forward, understanding God's blessing is amongst you. Now, I'm going to give you a a benediction on the screen, one that I don't normally give you. I want us to read this together, okay? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. This is from one of the earliest books of the Bible. This is one of the oldest benedictions there is to worship. And doesn't that have a um, nice, peaceful, loving tone to it? And we're in this space, or we're in the sanctuary, and we say something like this to one another before we go out and we get in the car and the um, child seat won't buckle or the oil light comes on or someone cuts us off as we're leaving or someone breaks in line at the restaurant or someone forgot that we were supposed to get eggs for the brownies that are, we have to take a class tomorrow or some whatever. You want to keep going? We're good. The Lord bless you and keep you and the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. So we're going to talk about that blessing and saying that someone is blessed and you keep this in mind as this person travels this journey. Genesis chapter 39 verse 1. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in the eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, The Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now Joseph was well-built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed Here's your next phrase. The clown. Joseph is taken down to Egypt after being sold as a slave. He's sold as a slave by whom? His brothers. You think like, my brothers were hard on me. If you're thinking that, if you're thinking, man, my brothers were hard on me. Or if you, as the older brother, think, man, I was hard on my little brother. We're not really establishing our worth based on comparison to others. We talk about that a lot in our household. But you didn't sell your brother into slavery. That's one thing. If we can come up short of that, if we can do anything, don't sell your brother. You did what? You sold your brother into slavery. Of course, they didn't tell their dad that. They got his jacket and put blood on it and took the jacket back to dad and said, he's what? He's dead. That's some vicious stuff. And as he is carried by these slave masters, which is a monster industry at that time, around to different places, he finds himself in this place, being bought by a very high executive in Pharaoh's court. So think about the times that you started from nothing. When you were in a new house and the yard was wrecked or the house was wrecked. When you had to totally rebuild a house. When you had to totally build a house. When you walked into a job in which you truly knew nothing. You truly knew no one. And you had to start from the absolute bottom. Whatever that was, your feelings are real. Your stress was real. Your pain was real. It wasn't like this. Sold as a slave. He's now a slave in this person's court. And he uh, uh, 
excels in his position. He excels so much that that person never even looks at the books again. And that's what I want you to consider. The blessing of Potiphar versus the blessing of Joseph. It says Joseph was blessed and he ended up sold into slavery by his brothers and now in this uh, court. Potiphar has got a blessing that he thinks is from this lowercase g God. Hey man, this guy, whatever he does and whatever he asks for, he just gets it. Of course, I own him. So all I have to do as his owner is just ask for stuff and then get it. You notice he said all he really thought about was what he ate. Uh, I've been on one cruise, fortunate uh, to go on a Disney cruise with uh, Katie's entire family. All 17 of us went in one place and traveled all together in every place that we went and all ate together on the cruise ship. Seemed like food came around all the time. Oh yeah, we're going to eat again. We're going to eat again? Well, yeah, actually it looks pretty amazing. And I understand on cruise ships that are not Disney cruises, they even have previews of the meal. You can go by the room and see what's going to be on that meal. So really, it's just going to shows, sitting in a chair, looking out at the water, maybe a little cat nap, and then uh, I guess it's time to eat again. So when we think, God's blessed me. I would like God to bless me. Some of the ways that we would like God to bless us is to remove concern, stress, and doubt. So that life can just be easier. Can't life just be easier? You can't have to take a cat nap and then eat again. So it's excellent to have these two examples right beside each other. Joseph traveling this journey in trying to excel in very difficult spots with God's blessing. Versus the lazy version of ourselves where we just say, I'd love to just ask God for whatever I want and then get to heaven. So the climb is um, incredibly steep. And somehow he finds himself next to one of the most significant people there is. Now, I started in ministry, I've told you, at 22 I went to my first annual conference pretty early on. At annual conference, you had the gathering of all United Methodist ministers in our state and two to uh, 12 members of each church all gathered in one spot. And when I started, it was at Wapa. And I got on an elevator that first year and somebody said, can you hold the elevator? And the bishop got on and a couple of people with the bishop, and they're just rushing. He's got thousands. I had no idea how many things he had to do. And he's got to just rush somewhere. He's got to get to his car. He's got to go eat. He's got to get back. He's got to get in his chair. So he's just getting in. <laughs> Door shut. <laughs> I said, that bag was heavy. <laughs> That's all I said to him. And he said, yeah, yeah, it is. And the door opened up. And that was it. That was my um, conversation with the first bishop that I had for seven years. You just never know when you're going to be in that proximity. Sometimes it uh, happens in a real hurry and you don't know what you're going to do. So, being sold to slave masters, yet then the slave masters sell you to someone who's incredibly significant. But then... The wife of that incredibly significant person proposition. It says the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph as he went up and as he went down. Verse 13. After she propositions him, this is in between. He says no and he runs and she grabs a piece of his cloak. When she saw that he left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak behind me and ran out of the house. 
She kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. And she told him this story. That Hebrew slave you brought us came to me to make sport of me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When the master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, This is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, a place where the king's prison, prisoners were confined. So your next phrase, the battle. What's the battle over? Truth. What's the truth? Have you noticed that we have a battle over the truth in this day? If you think, man, times are different. Yeah, technology is different. Geopolitical things are different. Uh, people's jobs are different. Occupations are different. <laughs> but people aren't different. People over all of human history have battled over what is true and what they are going to do about that truth or lack of truth. All things have become real estate to fight over. And there is uh, a number of media outlets in every direction that make tremendous profit over the battle of this truth. Tremendous profit. All these battles end up being all or nothing in both sides. There's no nuance, there's no middle ground. And cable news outlets, websites, social media, they're all convinced of what the truth is. And they're all deeply angry about that truth. Now, I printed off the um, 1980 television schedule. Okay? I was two years old. First noticing television. Chips. God loves chips. Uh, if I had DVR that age, I would have recorded them all and just watched them all, and when I was in California, I saw one of them and nearly lost my mind, <laughs> riding down the road. Archie Bunker's place, One Day at a Time, Charlie's Angels, Alice, The Jeffersons, Trapper John, M.D., The Tim Conway Show, MASH, ever heard of it? MASH. Uh, NBC Monday night at the movies, Thursday night at the movies, All My Children, Love Boat, Family Feud, One Life to Live, General Hospital, Magnum P.I. Did you see they're coming out with a new Magnum P.I.? Interesting. Will it be like that? Mork and Mindy, not slamming. Too Close for Comfort, Laverne and Shirley, Happy Days, Heart to Heart, what is that one? <coughs> Uh, greatest American Hero. That was, that was your jam, wasn't it? That's right. <laughs> Katie's dad convinced them that he was the greatest American hero. <laughs> CBS Wednesday Night Movies, Different Strokes, Facts of Life, Real People, Quincy and Me. Happy Days. What do you notice about all those listings? They're either comedies or dramas. It's, uh, I, don't, I don't know what genre to call it, well, I guess that, comedies or drama. You know how much news there was? I mean, there was local news and there was national news. What if, uh, see, the pressure that these people feel is that they had to fill, um, what, maybe 18 hours a day with television content. And that television content was from all sorts of sources. What if you had to fill 24 hours a day? What if you had to have someone talking about something 24 hours a day? Sports is the same way. ESPN used to have Sports Center from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. And sometimes I would watch it like three times, as you might imagine or I would see different parts of it. 
They don't repeat that show anymore. Now they have two people or three people in commentary that entire time. And then in the early afternoon, they start with it again all the way till 10 o'clock. Two, three, five people talking. And guess what they have to come up with that entire time? Content. We've got to find something to say. 18 hours a day. What if you had to, have to come up with something to say 18 hours a day to someone? How deep could you get into something? Or how shallow would you have to be in order to stretch it out to 18 hours a day? You know what happens on the sports network when you have to come up with 18 hours a day? Someone will ask in someone's second game, do you think they are Hall of Fame worthy? In their second game, are they Hall of Fame worthy? And the reason you have to do that is because we got to talk about something. We've talked about everything else. we got 17 more hours today. Now turn that to the news. Turn that to websites. Which one do you think feels more pressure to crank out more content? It's probably you. And if they felt that pressure to crank out that content in a way that you will pay attention, if they have to have something going on the ticker, if they have to have Two people talking, if they have to have the next thing, if they have to have a banner under the ticker, and the banner has something insane, the ticker has something insane, and the people are saying something insane. For 18 hours. You get that sort of thing. And imagine if there were a Clemson network and a Carolina network. And the two teams played, and the Clemson Network said they won, and the Carolina Network said that they won. And then you just watched television about Clemson coming up with 18 hours of how stupid Carolina is. And Carolina coming up with 18 hours about how stupid Clemson is. I fear how many of us would watch it. I fear how many of us would tune in to see that sort of content. That bad is over the truth. And if either side claims ownership, in my opinion, they're wrong. This is the thing that we've got to ask ourselves. This is the battle that we've got to face. Our inner desire to be certain, to be confirmed in our preconceived notions, and to rage in anger against morons, We've got to fight that. You know what the truth is? It's power. What power will do? Because the gender is reversed in this story. From your uh, typical accusation, it's typically a female accusing a male. It's typically a male being too aggressive against a female. In this way, it's female is being aggressive against the male. The accusation direction is also reversed. The one in power is accusing the one without power. Do you see a similarity though to any other instance? What if we ask what does power want to do? What do you think it wants to do? Well, if you see uh, two siblings, one's this tall and one's this tall, and there's one toy, and the sibling goes like this. What does power want to do? You want, you want to hold it up. Power wants to demand rather than request. And that's all there is to it. I don't care who has it. I don't care where they are. I don't care what gender they are. I don't care what age they are. I don't care what country they're in. I don't care if they're an elf or a donkey or some other kind of crazy animal. Power wants to demand rather than request. What kind of power does God have? More often than not, did God demand or did God request? 
More often than not, did Jesus demand or did he request? And what we've got to ask ourselves is, do we really believe it? Because if we say, yeah, I mean, church is fun, and I love to see my friends, and I love to sing, and, you know, he just says something interesting, he tells a good story, we do something strange, it's fun. But if you believe it, then you've got to question it, and you've got to live it. How am I desperately grabbing for power so that I can demand rather than request? This is a question you've got to ask yourself. Verse 39. While Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So that the prison warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison. And he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care again. Because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. So, um, the last phase. The resolve. The question is, do you have that? Are you willing to navigate this life with a certain humility and curiosity, claiming that God's blessing is presence with you, not leave? God's presence is drawing you to do something, not having you sit on a chair and look out at the water and never have to do anything until it's time to eat again. Do you have this resolve as a question? Before these people act, God is attempting to overcome the elements of power. And the phrase that's gone through all the texts that we've read since we started this uh, new series is promises. God's promises bring hope. Not God's promises bring naps. Not God's promises bring massive amounts of money. Not God's promises ensure that you will always be right and never have to worry about debate. Not God's promises get you to say whatever you want and demand it rather than request it. Since God's promises bring hope. Now, the interesting thing, if we, um, you, oh, you don't have to go back through it. If we talk about the phrases again, the climb, the battle, and the resolve. Who did you notice doing the majority of the work in those phrases? It was God going before Joseph. God offering Joseph that chance. So here's your final question. How do I expect to be blessed? As I go forth from this place with a blessing on my heart and in my mind, how do I expect to be blessed? Do I expect to have tremendous struggle in the fact that I'm going to be humble and curious? Or do I expect to be healthy, to never have any concerns for all of my loved ones and friends to live? And for me to thrive and have a wonderful time in my occupation? and for my um, different relationships to be as easy as they could possibly be. If you have that second expectation, then you will consistently wander, question, and wander away, away from God. If you are committed to understanding, to being blessed by God through your actions and belief in our God, then struggles come up because of your beliefs. But God will be present with you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you will stand as your aid for our modern affirmation. This is the way we affirm our faith in this worship service. You're welcome to participate and welcome to simply listen. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man. The gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope and the promise of God fulfilled. 
We believe in the Holy Spirit as a divine presence in our lives, reminding us always of the truth of Christ, our inspiration and strength in times of joy and sorrow. We believe our faith should be apparent in our words of love and acts of service that the kingdom of God may be a present reality here on earth. You may be seated. It's now time for our offering. You can give as the plate goes by. You can give electronically with instructions in the bulletin. If you're new to our church, if you're a guest, if you're a visitor, uh, it's not our expectation that you give immediately. You can rely on the generosity of our people.
than anything in the classroom. today and so are the youth and this side doesn't need to put their chairs away because we're going to need all of them for that okay cross trainers stepping stones youth are all in here listen to this <laughs> the lord bless you and keep you the lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you the lord turn his face towards you and give you peace not leisure peace in the midst of the storm. Go in peace. So I will stand. 